Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly 90 minute deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Dave. I'm a parent of a daughter in college, and we live in Chicago, Illinois. My name is Lisa. I'm a clinical psychologist and a college counselor. I am a parent of a boy in elementary school, a girl in middle school, and a girl in college. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. This week in the news, the persistent grip of social class on college admissions. A great article by Arvid Ashok of the New York Times. Our question from a listener is, my child is strong in STEM, but not in the arts. But he or she can draw. Should he or she take an arts course in high school in preparation for college admissions? Our interview is by Courtney Minden, the Vice President of Enrollment of Babson College on Understanding Babson. And our College Spotlight will come to you by Courtney Minden as she discusses Understanding Babson College. All right, Dave, I can tell Lauren's making progress, man, of waking you up and getting you more woke. You said he and she. He and she. You said he and she. Hey, 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 man, I'm going to get my Twitter account back from her yet. <laughs> <laughs> You're normally the Mr. He guy, when go, reflecting back when Princeton was a bastion of testosterone. <laughs> Do you realize you were there not very long after they went co-ed? Uh, yeah, I, well, you know, I, when I was there, the eating clubs, excuse me, um, <laughs> they still had all-male eating clubs, you know. So there you go. <laughs> for all you uh, non Princeton uh, awoke enlightened, Princeton outlawed uh, fraternities. So in their place, they decided they would come up with eating clubs. <laughs> 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 and, and and in order to get in, you you didn't rush into these eating clubs. You had to actually uh, go through a process where they argued, but they called it bicker. So it was. Bicker week to get into the eating club. So, yeah, th that was not a very woke institution when I went there. <laughs> they were so every time sleep. when you say he male instead of he she, or that, then we can blame it on Princeton eating clubs. Are you trying to tell me he's got a built in excuse? Yeah, yeah. I was part of the dinosaur unwoke class of <laughs> 1982. <laughs> okay, friends, we have a lot of announcements today. Uh, first of all, a big announcement. You know, we've said for some time that we are going to have college counselors meet and, and provide like a support group amongst ourselves for those in the profession. And I uh, want to provide a few more details based on feedback. Uh, looks like Thursday evenings are a great day for this and our, our other meetings, actually, that tested the best in our questionnaire. So we're going to kick this off on July 29th, Thursday, July 29th. And a number of you have written in and said, I'm a college counselor. I would love to be a part of this. I'm going to ask if you could just do it again, because unfortunately, I didn't put all those names in spreadsheets like I should have. I don't want to wade through <laughs> zillions of emails. So if you've, even if you have sent an email before saying, yeah, I'm interested, if you could do that again, it's questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. And I'll be working with Lisa and a few other West Coast counselors as well as we work on coming up with uh, an agenda um, and we may even send a survey out, um, uh, but you'll be notified at least two weeks early of, of the outline, but put that on the calendar, July 29th, Thursday, nine o'clock Eastern time, six o'clock Pacific time uh, for our first kickoff. And that's something we're going to do twice a year. Next. I also mentioned we'd be doing student panel discussions. Uh, we're going to start these in late August, still finalizing the details of who will be our first first panel discussion, what school. But we had over 150 suggestions come in from you as to school should be interested in. Um, another suggestion you had is you didn't like the idea of us requiring $10, at least a few people didn't, uh, to give us a donation to students for their time. 
Uh, some people preferred we make that suggested. And so that's what we're going to do. We'll make that a suggested donation so we can thank the students for their time. But that also will be a Thursday, uh, maybe one hour from nine to 10. And look for that to kick off in late August. And we'll get details to you at least three weeks in advance. But just just want to follow back up on a few things we've said, we've said, you know, we've talked about before. Now, another really big announcement. I'm very excited to announce this. So since the inception of our podcast, we've had no commercials. We've relied on free will giving of generous listeners. Dave, Lisa, and I, we don't take a penny uh, from any of this. In fact, all of us give money to actually support the podcast. Uh, and we've had a lot of expansion plans uh, in the past, but we really need the resources to do it. But fortunately, in the last 45 days, a number of new donors have stepped up and supported our podcast a uh, number of monthly donors, which you know we can rely on that every month. It helps with the budget. And we are so grateful that we are going to take a big step of faith. Dave, are you there? I am here, man. I'm, oh, I'm here. Okay. I'm, listen- I'm, I'm in the front pew, man. I ain't falling asleep. Oh, good. I'm listening to you. I thought you were back <laughs> at a Princeton eating club, man. <laughs> no, so no. There crickets listening. over there. Okay. I'm ready to say, preach, brother. What's the step of faith? <laughs> there you go. So Dave knows this. But we're rolling out. Your college bound kid YouTube. That's right. Our own YouTube channel. We're really excited about this pretty major undertaking. It's going to we'll hire two people to do it because none of us has time to do it or the knowledge or expertise. And it's going to cost us about seven grand to do this. But basically, what we're going to do is take every single segment of every podcast going back to episode one and break them down into sections. So we've got the in the news, that'll be its own video. The book chapter, the question from a listener, interviews, call a spotlight. That's over 800 segments, and that's going to be slowly going up. Now, not all at once, like one a day or maybe sometimes more than one a day. And another thing I'll tell you is starting with episode 180 with uh, the interview portions are actually videos. So I'm recording those in video. So if you want to know, hey, what does Christina, Dina, and Roman and Barnard look like? If you go to YouTube, you'll actually see the actual video because YouTube's better in a video format. So uh, that's a, that's something else that you can look forward to if you want to kind of see the, you know, verbal inflection, nonverbals and looks and all that stuff. We'll be doing that. So that's kind of something we're super excited about. We're going to encourage you, uh, yourcosmonkid.com. We're going to encourage you to hit the subscribe, hit the bell so you get new videos. But this is coming soon. Like this is going to be up in July. The two people we hired are working behind the scenes um, and Nemanja is doing a lot. He's the one breaking them down into individual video files, and the two people are doing the YouTube YouTube channel. So, Dave, thoughts on the YouTube channel? Man, I am so stoked. You know, this reminds me, just a couple weeks ago, I heard on the news the top 20 things that kids want to be when they grow up. And, you know, <laughs> doctors didn't make the ten, top 10, engineers. You know, what was the number one thing kids wanted to be when they grew up? Do you know what it is, Mark? Probably a YouTuber. <laughs> a YouTube influencer. <laughs> well, you know, so. you know why I you know why I say that? Because first of all, Karis is launching her own YouTube channel. She's got all the lights and everything, and and she's doing all the research now. And then Norm's Norm's daughter, Kristen, she has her own YouTube. She's a French tutor. She has her own YouTube channel. So I see it right in my own family. Wow. Well, all I know is I hope I'm like Ali, I hope I'm pretty enough to be on YouTube. <laughs> I guess they'll let us know. Y'all ain't pretty enough to be on YouTube. Yeah, Go back to radio. Well, all our warts and blemishes will be on full display. You know, we, we have said for Dave and Lisa and I, because I'm like, this is okay. We got to go on camera now. So we're not going to start going on until like episode 200. But the interviews that we're doing now will start going up in, in full video form. That's right. So. A lot of pressure to to make sure that we uh, live up to the influencer label. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say this: if you're someone who has never financially supported our podcast, and maybe you gave one, you know, one time or some time ago, and maybe you've been thinking about it, you know, now would really be a great time. It could we could really use your help as we roll out this uh, over 800 videos. It's a pretty big commitment we're making financially, and. Um, we're kind of excited about it and we're most grateful because we would not have done this if we hadn't had, um, an increase in gifts coming in, in the last 45 days to allow us to take this, uh, leap of faith. And so when we say you are our listening family, we really mean it. We, we call you 
especially our donors, we call you our podcast partners. And uh, you're the you're like the uh, what's the saying, Dave? You're the wind beneath our wings. The wind between. That's right. That's right. Now, don't start singing that song, man. They won't, <laughs> we, we'll lose all of our donations. Don't even think about it. <laughs> I think I'm going to take your advice on that one. <laughs> For all our listeners, thank you so much tonight. I got to say that when you send in your comments and your encouragement, Mark is always so stoked. He sends them to me and he'll send me three texts. Did you read it? Did you read it? And I'm like, brother, chill. I read it. <laughs> but he, he, we just love your responses and we just love your your uh, support. And it's so appreciated and so loved. So I just want to echo everything that Mark said. Yeah, I know. That's the fuel, man. That's the gas in our tank. You know, if you just did this and and you went on and looked at stats, that's like dry, sipping, boring. It's like it's the personal touches. And, you know, it's funny, just this week, Dave, a couple people reached out and said, been listening since 2018 or have heard every episode. And it's like, you know, this is literally someone we could be on an elevator. We wouldn't know who they are. But I'm like, wow, you've heard us for over 250 hours and we didn't bore you yet. So yeah, we're so. we're encouraged. Oh, and with speaking of one more thing, I am so inspired by my meetings with podcast listeners that I want to try to meet at least six people, maybe eight, we'll see, who come to Atlanta this year to visit colleges. So a lot of people come through Atlanta, they're visiting Georgia Tech, they're visiting Emory, they're visiting Spelman or Morehouse or Clark or Agnes Scott, or they're going to UGA. Those are usually the most popular ones. Occasionally, a place like Mercer or one of the other schools uh, people are coming town to visit. Um, I would love to meet you now. Here's the thing. I'm not driving all over Metro Atlanta. <laughs> so you're going to have to come to our house. But we've got Dave knows our set up here. We've got the whole basement set up, uh, long conference table and everything. And then our whole outdoor area has got a really nice meeting area. And I'm vaccinated outside. I'm cool. It's just I get inspired and exhilarated. So I want to meet at least six to eight of our listeners who are coming through Atlanta. Just send an email to questions at your college bound kid and we'll work on details. And I'm already getting fired up because I've had a chance to meet quite a few of you already that have come through Atlanta in the past, but I've never made an announcement like this. Dave, you don't count, man. You've got your own couch. You, you, you've got your own everything. Uh, well, I got to say the podcast listeners, you, you know, take Mark, Mark up on his offer because he redid his backyard. He's got a grill hut He and he's getting a hot tub. And uh, he's he even told me that he's got swimsuits for everybody. OK, so Dave, don't, don't push that. it. Don't push it. This is not a hot tub meeting. OK, the hot tub so, can be the scenery. OK, so, now you're giving my swimsuits away to our listeners. So I want to say that every listener... Go to Mark's house, go in the hot tub, just stay off my couch. That's all you have to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, they might get a burger fired up on the grill. Maybe we can do that. And Dave knows this. I'm all, all of a sudden, I've become this hardcore bird watcher. So we've got all these birds up everywhere. It's kind of fun. Uh, but yeah, I'd, be, I'd, love to, I'd love to meet you, hear your story. A lot of people come through the ATL, and you know how to reach me. Um, also, feel free to text me at 404-664-4340. 404-664-4340. Yes, I don't mind putting my cell number out there. Are you ready for admissions vernacular, admissions tip, Dave? I'm ready, man. I'm ready. Okay. So our admissions tip, and this is a great tip. It actually initially was generated by one of our listeners who, one of the listeners I told you, I, did a, I met with on Zoom video this week, and uh, her and her husband, and they were talking about the, they were seeking advice you know, regarding college visits. And the whole conversation came up, what I shared last time about how I love to talk to all these students. And it's just one of my favorite things to do. And uh, the mom brought up a really good point. And it's something that uh, I've talked about before, but not as much as I should. She said, Mark, you're an extrovert. What if you're an introvert? I don't know if I could do that now, let alone when I was a kid, like just go up to strangers and start talking to them. So the question is, what if you're an introvert? What do you do? Do you just give up on that option? And say, well, I guess I can't do that. And so I want to say a couple things for you if you're in that situation. One, this is going to shock people. But up until the second grade, I was so painfully shy that I pretty much didn't even speak in class. I was like petrified. In fact, when I got to Michigan State, I knew I was going to have to do some public speaking. I was, I was like scared stiff. So what I did was I took three different public speaking courses just to get over the fear. And it wasn't until the third one that I got a comfort level. 
So there are a lot of things that you're nervous about. Your heart might be pounding and pounding before an interview or pounding before you go into a public speaking um, situation. But if you break through and try it, you'll find I actually can do it. So one thing I want to say is don't let your fears paralyze you. But I don't only want to say that because some people I really understand just can't do it or they're not at that point yet. So the second thing is consider going on a college visit with a friend who's a little bit more extroverted. And the two of you can do this together and they can be the one that can initiate the talking and you can listen and get all the benefits. So those are two options for you if you just feel like you just can't talk to strangers. Any thoughts, Dave? I think that's excellent. I mean, the fact is, is that we're in an increasingly challenged society socially. And so there's a lot of people who are in this position. And I, I think that our increasing reliance on social media has not helped many of our kids because uh, they're not used to face-to-face -face interactions. So I'm glad you addressed it. And I think bringing along a wingman, that's what we used to call him. Hey, I love it. <laughs> Bring the wingman. That's Bring what I should have said. <laughs> <laughs> or the wing lady, <laughs> bring, you Princeton Eating Club, club all male and, dude. <laughs> that's right. You know, for all y'all who haven't seen, who's seen Top Gun, you know, <laughs> bring around your Maverick, even if you are a goose. <laughs> you okay, got that one went totally over my head. Oh, you haven't seen the movie Top Gun? No, Dave, you know I don't want that. No, oh. I'm not a movie buff like you. <laughs> oh, man, uh, how how you I know. on YouTube I'm in the dark. you haven't seen on Top Gun? <laughs> 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 But for all I don't have time to watch all these movies. I just work. <laughs> Make sure you bring Maverick around to the bar so when you see Singh, you've got that loving feeling, he can start you off on the tune. You'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, I think everybody got that. That went over my head. I know that I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a strange bird when it comes to this stuff. All right. Okay. So for our admissions vernacular, whole person admissions, whole person admissions. What's that, Dave? You, talk, you said old person? Whole, H-O-L-E. Whole, whole, whole person. Well, that's probably the holistic approach, you know? So we, we are looking at the whole person, right? You got it. I gave you an easy one. You know what? That was so easy. I'm, 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 I'll, I'll call it there. I was tempted to give you a second one, but I'll save no. it for next week. No, no. Let's <laughs> stop while I'm ahead. <laughs> you know, we're talking about that a little bit today, so I thought I'd introduce it now. All right, the big number. Yes. And the big number is 101 billion. That is really a big number. What's that, Dave? Is that, is that a 101 million? Well, that's a seven figure. So is that like, what do they call that? Is that like 11 figures or something? I don't oh, even know. What? It's got 101 be billion? Some sort of money budget allocated to something. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. And it's how much money parents took in Parent Plus loans out last year. Wow. Which is an like increase that. of 40%. Adjusted for inflation. So that number was $72.2 billion at the end of 2014. So that's up 40%. And it's a total of 3.6 million Parent PLUS loans, which I'm not a fan of. I understand sometimes people need to do them for small amounts. But, you know, I don't like them because, one, parents need to think about the retirement. But, two, high origination costs, high interest rates. And a lot of parents are putting themselves in a position that's, just not tenable. There is no borrowing plan if you didn't save properly for retirement. Now, I used to just be anti-Parent Plus loans completely. I've modified my view a little bit. Now it's a little bit more like you run a budget. You do a loan calculator and you look at it and you say, let's say it says, okay, it's going to be 225 a month. If you're like, oh, I can fit that in my budget. You use the same ratios that you do when you're buying a home, 28%, 36%. If you can fit it in your budget and it's a modest amount, I'm okay with it, but I'm still not a fan. But one hundred and one billion, and and I believe these are loans that cannot be discharged even in bankruptcy. Is that correct? Correct, correct. And they are one hundred percent in the parent's name. And what I tend to see is people usually choosing to go to a school that's unaffordable when they're at the point where they're taking these out. But I've learned not to be black and white about it. I have had some people I've worked with that said, look, Mark, I don't see any other way. We didn't get enough scholarship money. We're going to this school. And one of my former people I worked with, they had a pretty strong conversation about that. And, um, you know, his, his daughter is in this incredibly strong program at Stanford PhD program right now. So he kind of has no regrets. So, I've learned not to be dogmatic about it, but watch your budget because uh, there are 
I mean, the amount of parrot borrowing that's out there right now is pretty scary. All right, Dave, take it away. We got a good article today, which I'm excited about. Yes, we do. Let's we do. Let's turn the page. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. This is The Persistent Grip of Social Class on College Admissions by Arvind A. Shook of the New York Times. And the caption of it is, It's hard to disentangle social class from the college admission process. So it's a good article, and it's actually not surprising when we talk about what it's about. Uh, Basically, it said, it started off with the University of California system and how it dropped the consideration of the SAT and ACT as part of a settlement in a lawsuit alleging that these tests are biased along the lines of race, wealth, and disability. And then it went on to say that more than one half of U.S. colleges have now made these tests optional for the 2021 admissions class. But despite this step, there is still a significant influence of socioeconomic background on the admission process. So the questions are how and why. And it really focuses on three aspects, mostly A, the college essay, B, recruiting visits, which we just discussed last week, and then C, to a lesser extent, certain extracurricular activities and sports that are often only accessible to the wealthy. So Mark, I'm gonna briefly talk about some of the points in the college essay and then throw it out to our general discussion. Sounds good? Yeah, sounds great. Okay, so bottom line is they really focus mostly on the college essay and they say that the college essay is the most important soft factor in today's college admissions. The, and it's the fourth most important overall factor, the other three being grades, curriculum strength, and test scores. But he says that essays, number one, can be polished by paid professionals or a well-educated parent, and well-educated parents are often of a higher socioeconomic class, and that uh, the essay content is often determined by socioeconomic status. And Mark, I'm sure you'll discuss that more. And he also said that the kids often of lower socioeconomic status have uh, are often incentivized or feel pressure to quote unquote sell their pain in their essays and Mark will talk about that and he also said that the history of many of these soft factors actually has its history in discrimination and he goes back and talks about a book by uh, called The Chosen and which it says that a lot of these factors were created in the 1920s to exclude Jews in particular from elite college systems. And then it talks about recruiting visits and standout extracurricular activities. But Mark, let us let me stop now and ha- throw it open and see where you want to take this. So that was fantastic. Let me just supplement a few things in addition to what you said. So the article is based on a fascinating study. It was done, like Dave said, the University of California, and it looked at t- the year 2016. And what they did was they used software to classify essays that were written by 60,000 applicants to the University of California system. And what they did was they looked at different things like what type of syntax was used, such as how many commas, total punctuation, who used longer words. And they found that that was completely correlated with household income. And now the article is very clear that they were unable to say, okay, the people that had the higher income and had these more sophisticated essays, at least grammatically, They're unable to say they got in at a higher rate, like they don't have access to that kind of data. But they pointed out that there were just such different writing patterns between people of means and those who were under-resourced. And another thing that was really different was the topics. So what they found was that more affluent families wrote a lot on things like human nature and seeking answers about sensory experiences, like maybe they would talk about their trip to the, uh, oh, I always say this right, word wrong, Dave. What's it, the Galop- Galopolis Islands? Galapagos. Is that right? Yeah. Galapagos yeah. Islands. Charles Darwin. And I, I remember that because that was a common essay when I did admissions that I would get from more affluent families, actually. That's right. So that's why I had a drawback to me reading up, you know. They would talk about things like that. And 
what they found with with lower income and under resourced families is they would talk a lot about their interpersonal relationships. They would talk about school issues. They would talk about things like tutoring groups. And so it was just a completely different topics as well as a different writing style. And actually, the people that had done this study had done a previous study before. Uh, Sonia Geibel, a PhD candidate of sociology of education at Stanford, she had done a previous study and found the same thing. So this kind of confirms it. And the thing that makes this article so powerful is so often we've had conversations about test scores in the context of, oh, they favor the wealthy, they favor the privileged. They're highly correlated to, to wealth and income. And I've probably contributed to that as much as anybody because I've brought that up a lot. And what this article says is every aspect of the admission process, every component yes. that ends up being used has a wealth component to it. Every one. And so it, this article focuses on some, like it points out colleges tend to visit places that are wealthier and white. And we've talked about that recently. It talks about extracurriculars and how that's correlated to wealth. It talks about how schools are looking at the ability to pay. And it doesn't even go into things such as who attended private schools or better public schools that have better funding or property taxes are higher or the benefit of having educated parents. So it doesn't talk about any of those things. But here's a quote from the article that I really like. It says this. I'm going to read it. Colleges are caught between multiple goals. Predicting the people most likely to succeed academically, identifying talent missed by conventional metrics, collecting adequate tuition income, enrolling a diverse class of students, encouraging and enabling social mobility, and then complying with legal constraints of affirmative action. So they're like contorted being pulled in a million directions, right? But a lot of those pull them in the direction of having to target people of means. And so another thing that I really like about the article is it pushes back at the concept that test scores are not the only thing correlated with income, and they're getting all the brunt of the criticism. There's another quote for the article. It's really easy to overlook the influence of socioeconomic background on all the other admission yardsticks. And then it does talk about whole person admissions or holistic admissions. And it's did you notice, David, kind of had a bit of a critical tone of, to, about holistic admissions? It, it did. It did. Because it basically it called out the history of hypocrisy right. behind its origins and its, uh, its and even its applications today. Dave, why don't you talk about that? The book, The Chosen, you're familiar with it. Why don't you give our, our listeners a little bit of a background there, uh, what it's referring to there? It's a classic book by Jerome uh, Carabell, I believe his mm -hmm. name is. Yep. He was Jewish. And it would talk about the history of Jews in the uh, admission process. Most people don't know that uh, at the turn of the century, going up to the first 20 years, Jews started to dominate elite college admissions. And I'm talking to Harvard, Princeton, so forth, like never before. And yeah, and that book focuses mostly on Harvard, Princeton, Yale, those three schools. That's correct. And, and in fact, uh, Mark and I were reading a, a similar article that said that uh, Jewish uh, – uh, matriculation to these institutions actually peaked in the early 1920s, so much that it really started to alarm the uh, establishment white Anglo-Saxon Protestant elite. And the problem was, was that Jews were hitting all the test scores totally out the park. They were truly, they, they, they were the Asian Americans, <laughs> so to speak, of the 1920s. That's no, true. And in order to mitigate, cancel out, balance out their academic excellence, they changed college admissions to be from being very quantitative to be very qualitative, to look for ideas of fit and ideas of character, which were just disguises to actually exclude qualified Jews from the admission process. In fact, there was a stunning statistic that in, I believe, 1911, one half of all the college students admitted to Harvard, Princeton, and I believe Yale flunked the college admission test <laughs> for those schools because they were legacy admits. And so the Jews were actually um, threatening the legacy admits. So because of quote-unquote holistic admissions, they were actually able to systematically exclude a whole generation of Jews and get the... Uh, get the uh, 
percentage of Jews being admitted to these elite colleges from at some point uh, the high 20s to actually single digits, which persisted until the 1960s when uh, that discrimination was recognized and, and, and addressed and, and, and so forth. So that's the, the, the history of holistic admissions that we carry through today. And, uh, you know, this, this article points out that holistic admissions still plays a part in excluding students based on socioeconomic status. Is that an accurate uh, prescription? Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm a, a passionate believer in holistic admissions. I've been in a school that did it. I've been in a school that didn't do it. I do believe it's a superior way to do admissions. I believe in it to the core of my bone. But it is holistic and holistic admission is human admissions. And it brings all the human factors in, including people's biases. For those of you who are new, the opposite of holistic admissions, I call it admissions by the numbers. There's other names for it as well. But it's basically using just the numbers, right? Things like GPA, test scores, class rank, and making decisions strictly off that without getting to know the person and the background behind the person, such as their character, things they might have overcome, um, and their emotional intelligence and all kinds of other aspects. So I'm a huge believer of it, but it does have it is fraught with problems because of the biases that can come when you're looking at things through the through the human lens and the human prism. So I don't want to get off on that too much, but I think for people that are not familiar, it's good to have that background. So now we get to test scores. Now, I want to, I want to say something about this because I was thinking, Dave, I feel like maybe I haven't done a very good job of being lucid and being um, crystal clear of my views on test scores. I think that if someone was to say, what is stuck believe on test scores? Well, I think people would say, well, I think he thinks that test scores um, have such a socioeconomic bias because they're so highly correlated to income and education that it's that school should either be test optional or test blind. I think that's what people would think. And I want to go into my view and just understand what I actually believe. So my view is this. Don't just assume that scores bring so much predictive value that they're worth the drawbacks that they bring. Do the research. And if you've done the research and you show that test scores correlate to success in, in, in a substantial way, you know, at your school, then use them. And, you know, you know, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, Dave. MIT's done that research. Yale's done that research. They feel there's a correlation. So that's why I'm fully expecting them to go back. Um, WPI, Worcester Polytech, had a different result. They found the correlation wasn't that great. So they're not. So they're proud to be test optional. That is what I believe. I believe you need to be research-based and be data-driven. Um, I do believe there is a flaw in test scores. And believe it or not, the biggest flaw I see in test scores is not its correlation to family income and wealth, because everything is correlated to that. Yes. The big I'm gonna I'm gonna pull out an analogy and show the biggest flaw I see with test scores. So two women go in for job interviews. One very, very classy dresser. She's got the skirt, the blouse, the hair's done right, the nails, the jewelry, the makeup, everything's just right. The other one's got torn, tattered, frayed, written all over jeans and a scrubby t-shirt. So Dave, who had the better interview? Presentation, my man. I'm going to say the one that looks fly. <laughs> so the reality is it doesn't almost matter what the one with the torn, tattered, frattered, you know, <clears throat> frayed jeans and scrubby t-shirt said because they never got a chance for their message to be heard. The dress introduced such a profound bias, such a strong first impression that is the it was famous quote says your life speaks so loud I can't hear what you say the message couldn't get through and that is my biggest concern with test scores and it was best illustrated if you heard my interview with Lisa Prescott who's been the director of admission at, for at UCSB for a very long time and has been at the school now for 36 years before UCSB University of California at Santa Barbara before they went test blind she said, Mark, we're debating going test blind ourselves in our office before the UCs announced it. Why? Because scores introduce such a bias that we're not sure as readers if we can properly underscore the role of character and all the emotional intelligence factors. And so this is somebody with 35 years experience and saying numbers introduce such a bias. That is my biggest concern with test scores. And I experienced it myself in admissions. Test scores played way too much of a role in my decisions, especially in my first four years, because of the power of numbers. And one reason I don't like to talk with about about rankings that much, if I Dave, if I say to you, you know, I've got two schools I'd like Lauren to look at. I think they're both great. 
I think they're fantastic. Either one I think would be really great for her. Um, I want you to know one's ranked thir- 37th and the other's ranked 81st. Doesn't that immediately enter produce a bias? It does. It does. Somebody put it this way. The test actually does a really good job at the extremes. It kind of really does. People don't want to admit it. Like on the very high end and the very low end, it is revealing some very important information. The problem is most people are in the middle and it does a terrible job at differentiating someone maybe from the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile as to who would do better because there's so many other factors like drive, motivation, discipline, things like that, that will end up determining who will do better for for the people in the murky middle, if that makes sense. Many times, especially when you look at the lawsuits, the African lawsuits, where they're trying to distinguish the difference of Asian test scores and white test scores and Hispanic and black, the differences between those groups are not statistically significant when it comes to the predicting which one of those groups will be successful in college or in life. The, 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 the gap is way too narrow. So you're trying to make distinctions uh, based on meaning, meaningless differences in the data. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let, let, let's go back to something else that was in the article, Dave, because this is not so much an article about testing as it is about essays and other factors, right? Right. And it's basically saying, in effect, test scores are getting a bad rap. And I kind, I would agree with that. Like, test scores are the – remember, it's the Edan Shahar point, Dave. Right. Don't fixate so much on test scores and give us all the blame and talk about socioeconomics. It's a right. scarcity issue. And if it's not test scores, it's going to be something else. Because let's go down and look at all these other aspects of the, of the admission process. Extracurriculars. Do you know how much it costs to pay travel ball, volleyball or to be on a high-level travel lacrosse team, let alone some sport like equestrian or crew? Like these things take a lot of resources. And I'm going to say something I've never said on this podcast before. It's probably going to seem controversial, but I believe this. And I base this off working with a a couple thousand students now over the last, you know, 22 years. So I was thinking about this, Dave. If you give me a C tester, like let's just say C is average, right? So we know that the average scores every year, they're between 1059 and 1080 on the SAT and they're between 20.9 and 21.3 on the ACT. So just give me a, somebody, a, let's just call it like that person, a C tester, right on that level. Moving that person to an A tester, even with very good test prep, it is a lot harder to do that than it is for me or Lisa or one of the other really talented college counseling professionals who listen to this podcast to take a C essay and move it to an A essay. That is much easier to do. That's correct. It's much easier to do. So you can really make the case that privilege and bias is much more easy to be reflected when it comes to the essays than it is test scores. So why are test scores getting all the brunt of all of the criticism? Some of it is because colleges don't like the billion dollar test prep industry. Some of it is because they don't like the stress kids feel they experience because so much is riding on four hours on a Saturday when they take the test. Some of it is about how it impacts students' mental health. Some of it is they feel it is an impediment to diversity. Some of it, and this is a major reason in a lot of instances, is they feel it is an impediment to them getting more applications. And some of it is they've bought into the propaganda that test scores are uniquely correlated to income, which is simply not true. I'm, pre- I'm going to predict something, Dave, and I've been thinking about this a lot. I think you're going to see a backlash against the backlash. And I think you're going to start to see one more schools coming out and being honest and saying, you know what, we have some research that shows that it correlates. And I think you're going to see a lot of public universities, flagship and regional publics, and, especially, and a lot of engineering schools and some highly selective competitive science programs I think in 20, especially larger universities, in 2023, I think you're going to see quite a few of them go back to requiring the test. Because requiring the test where it's used properly and interpreted in the appropriate way is, I think, going to be helpful. I think there was an over-reliance on the test at one point, but it's a matter of balance. So what you're saying, Mark, is schools are realizing they don't quite want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. They want to reintroduce the test maybe with some more perspective. Yeah. That would, the only thing I would add to that would be some schools, right? Like some um, schools, yeah. the way liberal arts and science schools operate, there's a lot of reasons why they can 
not pay as much attention to the test. For one, especially the more wealthy ones, they have very large admission offices compared to the size of their school, which means they can really go to great lengths to get to know an applicant, including things like interviews, requiring lots of recommendations, thoroughly getting to know the school, really getting to know the grading system, even down to which teachers grade harder to school. So there's things that they can do to really suss out people that could do well. And the, and the larger, especially state schools, they just don't have the uh, resources to operate that way. And then also just the way their curriculum is, just the interdisciplinary nature of the curriculum. Once you get into curriculums that require you to have to take certain uh, courses, especially ones that are correlated with, with with strong math, it's just harder. So anyway, I, I, I feel like we're turning this whole thing into a test score discussion. I don't want to do that. Right, right. But the main takeaway, uh, I think, is test scores have got a little bit of a backlash. Everything's highly correlated to income, not just test scores. And I think that you're going to start to see that be reflected a lot more as people figure out where they're moving forward on this. And I just want to add one more thing about extracurriculars, that it's virtually impossible now for an average kid, even one that's naturally talented, to succeed in most extracurriculars without an immense amount of financial support. You mentioned all that, that you can't get, go forward in volleyball or hockey or even basketball now uh, without all these travel teams and extra coaches and all this other experience you need other than the high school. I think that's one of the reasons why football remains so powerful in the South because it's one of the few uh, sports that poor, talented athletes can still play and excel at despite the fact they may not have access to all this other um, wealth needed to succeed. Well, football benefits by the fact that there's 85 scholarships um, available and there's lots of injuries. Right. And it's in it because it drives so much of the whole athletic budget. It gets so prioritized where you're going down to sports like tennis and, you know what I mean? And golf. And they're just taking a few spots Right. that the peop the person that's going to emerge out of that is the person that's been like playing since, most of the time since they were seven with the best trainers and travel, travel opportunities that just require money. So I agree a hundred percent. And I think it is time that when we talk about the advantages that wealth brings, that we don't just make it about test scores. It's everything. But I also want to say this, and this is important, and I'll close with this, Dave, because someone could turn around and say, wait a minute, you're an independent college counselor. Like, people pay you. So you're part of the problem. And what I want to say is there's absolutely nothing wrong with a family using every bit of all of their means to provide the absolute best opportunity for their kids. That's true with healthcare. And that's true with education. That's called being a good parent. So this is not about scapegoating people because they have resources and they're using them for the betterment of their, of their child, right? Like that's what you should do as a parent. But at the same time, we also should not be naive about privilege. Remember, uh, Dave, I was living in Dallas at the time when Ann Richard spoke at the Democratic Convention in 1988. And she said of George Bush, poor George he was born on third base and thought he hit a triple. Right. And that's we don't want you to be naive about your own privilege because then you're you know, you're you're kind of arrogant and you're just detached from reality. But we don't want to make people feel guilty because they use their privilege to help their kid. That's what everyone does if they're honest, if they love their kids. Yeah. There's a great quote. I can't remember who said it, but I love mm -hmm. it and it's uh by a very distinguished either scholar or or eminent uh, uh, person who said, if I have seen so far in life, it's only because I have been standing on the shoulders of giants. And the reality is all of us who have got ahead have done so because we have had someone elevating us and lifting up to positions of opportunity. And there's nothing fear about in life about that. Some people just have more opportunity than others. But I think it's important that we all be humble and recognize that for most of us, we owe our success to the grace of God and to the, to the help of other people. And uh, that should explain a lot of why the world is what it is. So There you go. Like you said, you went, you went Bible, I'll go Bible. There's a verse in the Bible. What do you have that you did not receive? That's right. If then you receive it, why do you boast as, as if you did not receive it? And that's 1 Corinthians 4, 7. 
You know, don't think you're all that in a bag of chips because a lot of what you have, you have because of the opportunities you've been given. I used to have this on my, in my office, Dave, on a big sign poster. When you see a turtle on a, you know, on a fence post, they didn't get there on their own. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for a question from one of our listeners. So, Lisa, I have a question for you. Have you ever had a song in your head? It's just stuck and you can't get it out. Oh, it's every day of my life, Mark. It's every day of my life. <laughs> Which one do you have in your head? So, you know what? It relates to you. Oh, no. <laughs> That's even so, worse. <laughs> so, you know, this song is like. All the single ladies, all the single ladies, all the single ladies, all the single yeah. ladies, all the singles. You know that one? All the single ladies. Yeah. Now put your hands up, up in the club. We just broke <laughs> up. Now I'm doing my thing. And so ever since you said you're like single mom for 10 weeks, yeah. I'm like, that's the song. And I think at least I think all the single ladies. So where are you in week week five, week four, week three? Where I are we am at? Week, what did, I'm week four, in a week four. You know, I've managed not to kill any kids or pets. So I think <laughs> well, that's, that's good, good, especially kids. But, you know, maybe Beyonce <laughs> can re-record this for us, all the single moms. <laughs> 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 Let's put that out there in the universe, Beyonce. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Well, you'll have to, after when you get to the 10 week, you'll have to tell us lessons learned. Lessons learned. Oh, yeah. But we are picking it up right now. We're talking about your peeps. We promised. This is That's the Princeton right. Review countdown. You know, we did the, the schools that packed the stadium. Mm -hmm. And now we're doing the there is a game. Really? There is a game? <laughs> and for those who don't know what we're talking about, because you're first time listeners, we, we kind of start out a little lighthearted. And Lisa and I are doing a countdown based on a Princeton Review study of survey of 143,000 students at 386 different colleges. And it's kind of fun. And they list it. They do it every year. And so this is the 2020 version of there is a game. And in other words, people don't pack the gym. So the question <laughs> is, how many of these schools did Lisa consider? <laughs> That's the question. All of them. I'm telling you that right now without even seeing the list. <laughs> that was like a requirement. <laughs> yeah. People, check this box. You're off my list. Um, <laughs> you know what? I will say this. In going through this, one thing, and it makes a lot of sense, of the top 20 they have on here, they probably have eight of them that don't have a thousand kids and they probably have like five of them that have like under 400. So it's really hard to pack the gym and even have a robust sports team when you have like 350 kids in your school. Right. <laughs> right. And all the kids have to play all the sports all year long. Otherwise. Correct. Very Correct. Exhausting. So here we go. Number 20 Cooper union, 806 students in New York, New York. Number 19, Pace University, New York, New York. Number 18, St. John's College, the Great Books Program, Santa Fe, New Mexico, a whopping grand 269 kids. And then at number 17, a school we've done a spotlight on, USF, University of South Florida. I think that's starting to change a little, but compared to UF and FSU and UCF, I can understand in the Florida context why it would feel that way compared to other Florida schools. And they do have thirty eight over 38,000 kids. Number 16, Carnegie Mellon. Definitely not a sports rabble-rousing place. Pittsburgh. 15, another one, Bennington College in Virginia. 700 kids. 14, Sarah Lawrence College. Bronxville, a little more than 1,000 kids. 13, SUNY Purchase. They're doing theater there and theater arts. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 3,600 kids. Then we got number 12, Suffolk University, Boston. Number 11, Pitzer College. Definitely not uh, a rabid sports place there. And 920 kids. Number 10, Olin College of Engineering with a whopping 310 kids in need of mass. So like you said, every kid would have to do every sport, right? <laughs> Number nine, Skidmore College, Saratoga Springs. Number eight, McGill University. They do have some Canadian schools in here. Number seven, Thomas Aquinas in California, <clears throat> Santa Paula with a whopping 360 kids. Number six, McDaniel College, Westminster, Maryland. Number five, College of the Atlantic with a whopping 366 kids in Bar Harbor, Maine. Number four, Reed College. Reed's the kind of place I would have think you, did you look at Reed? I did. I did look at Reed. I knew it. I knew it. 
He and seemed like Saint a John's reed. Also, see, <laughs> see, <laughs> you're proving our point. Number three, Brandeis, three thousand six hundred eighty-eight kids. Number two, Hollins, the Women's College in Roanoke, six hundred eighty-seven kids. And this surprised me that it was number one. Wash you. Really? Yeah, like I'm surprised because, you know, we've got a lot of kids there. They actually win a lot of Division Three championships because they're, well, first of all, they're a really big Division Three school, right? Almost 8,000 kids. I might have thought even Emory would have been ahead of, that's a lot of my students do complain at Emory about that. Like, this is not the place to come for sports. I'll tell you that. But that's the list. Lisa, any comments? Wow. Well, you know, um, I think that a lot of these schools, you know, I will say this, like maybe I didn't go to the sporting events, but I never missed a musical. So there you go. I, we need to do I that would be list. Very happy. We need to do the musical theater list. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right, Lisa, take it away. What do we have today? Well, this question is from Ryan. And Ryan says, my child, who is strong in STEM and ELA classes, has no art type activities or classes. She doesn't really like classes or activities that would fall under the arts category. However, she is fairly good at drawing. Would it be beneficial to her for her college admissions for her to take art classes in high school? If so, should she take them every semester, one semester a year, or just a few times in high school? And I have to give a shout out to Ryan because Ryan is from a state I lived in for seven and a half years, the great state of Texas. So he's coming to us as a dad from Texas. All right. So so this question, it actually gets asked in a lot of different forms. So I want to ask, answer it around art and drawing and should you take art classes and beneficial. But I also want to expand it to some other things where it comes up frequently. And you may know this, Lisa, because this kind of falls in the whole psychology realm. But did you remember when that book came out, Do What You Love? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You probably tell us about the book, Miss Reader. No. Do you remember anything? No? Okay. <laughs> I guess I didn't love it enough to read it, Mark. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. Honest. I guess not. <laughs> so for a while, I was all into that book. You know, basically, the essence is sort of like, do what you love, and you'll never feel like you work today in your life, and the money will flow, and don't focus so much on... When you're starting out thinking about career and salary, don't look so much at salary and income. Start internally with what is it that I love. And not only will you be happier, but you'll probably end up being prosperous, too, because you'll be good at it. And so and then also there's some like psychological testing that they do in that book as well. But uh, do what you love. Like it's all about what you love. And if you don't enjoy it, then quite honestly, not enjoying it trumps the fact that you're good at it. Mm -hmm. And I get this a lot from and a, a lot of different people, you know, bring this up. Sometimes it's even related to athletics. Uh, I'll be talking to a student and they're really athletic and they've done really, really well. They've really excelled and they have the opportunity to play sports in college and they don't love it that much. And I usually tell them, I said, listen, this is definitely true of D2 and D3 and I mean, D1 and D2 and sometimes D3 too. Like it, college sports can feel like a job. Mm-hmm. And if you don't love it, it's going to be drudgery. I mean, there's so many of my daughter's former basketball friends that she played with at a high level that aren't happy right now. And she came to the conclusion, I don't love it enough for it to dominate my college experience, even that she could play it. One high level basketball coach says, you're not going to play at 400 colleges. I'm telling you that. But still, that just wasn't appealing to her. So you got to do what you love. And that applies to art class. It applies to athletics. It applies to clubs you join. What you love trumps what you're good at and your life will be so much more enjoyable. And and, and this is the same thing any college admission officer would say. Like, if you don't love it, don't do it. Now, one thing I will say, because she's asking specifically about classes here. So you do need to watch your school requirement, Mm -hmm. right? And your school could have a requirement that there's an arts elective or an arts course. And so that would be the one exception to this, like pay attention it's pretty common for schools to want some type of exposure to the arts, but it doesn't mean it would need to be drawing. She doesn't like, you know, she can maybe usually it could be music or it could be something else artistic. Um, so that would, of course, be be the be the one exception. But there's actually a long list of things that families oftentimes think that they need to do. And they have a have the sense that if I don't do this, this may not look that good in college. And I'll tell you what the most frequent one I hear more than anything Lisa, is volunteering. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many people say, oh, my goodness, my child doesn't have any volunteering. 
uh, this on their on their high school transcript. This is terrible. They need to start now, uh, you know. And, and believe it or not, you don't have to do volunteerism. There's not magical extracurriculum or uh, things that you need to be involved in to get admitted, because colleges want all types of kids. Uh, now, this is a class, okay. And this is very, very, very different advice than what we call your academic GPA, your core classes. Right. Very different. Yes, yes, yes. So we're going to, you know, be talking about that a lot in episode 180 because we're going to look at the ninth and 10th grade and what you need to be doing there. Um, so we're not talking about math, English, science, social science or foreign languages, but this is an elective art. And so what do you want to say um, on this topic, Lisa? that, you know, maybe in the past, there was this idea that there had to be the well-rounded student, you know, somebody who was like a jack of all trades who did everything. One of my daughter's friends was volunteering as the wrestling coach manager, and it seemed very out of place for her. And I said, well, why are you managing the wrestling team? Well, I need to for my college application. I was like, I, I don't think so. And she, of course, was a fantastic student and got into a great program. I don't know if the wrestling management really helped or hindered that. But I just thought it wasn't a good use of her time. But she didn't love wrestling. It's better just when it's your optional stuff, just to try to pursue what you like, pursue your passions. I mean, and it's interesting because where we were in Illinois, they didn't require any arts classes, but my daughter took two a year because she loved it. But I think here I just learned in our local high school system, they require you to take four years of art. So my son is really yeah. going to be enjoying that. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, four years. Yeah. I would have struggled in there because <laughs> I, I didn't like it and I wasn't good at it. I was brutal. Yeah. I remember one time my daughter said, I remember one time my oldest daughter, because she's quite talented at art. She's from young age. She's like, please don't tell me that's a chair. <laughs> You're not trying to draw a chair there, were you? Please tell me that that was not a chair. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, you know. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, I think it'll include music or, you know, um, choir or you know drama or theater arts so it's a broad thing so hopefully every kid can find something that they love and that under that big umbrella but I think if it's not required and you don't like to do it and you like to do other things do those things yeah and I said this once before in the podcast I'll say it again if I if you forced me and said Mark you can only pick one thing one piece of advice that you hear more often than anything from college admission officers, what would it be? And I've said it would be, be yourself. Stop trying to do things you think we want you to do. Mm -hmm. Do you. Yeah. Do you. That's one of those sayings. Do you. And I'll even go a step further. Colleges like to think that they can look at your extracurriculars, look at what you've done in the summer, look at electives you've taken, and get some sense of who you are by that. And so looking at electives as an indication of what a student loves is part of an overall assessment of trying to like figure out who this person is. And um, I should have had it in front of me. I've said it before in the podcast. It's one of my absolute favorite quotes ever. And I'm going to butcher it, but I'll try to do a summary. It's by Robin Mamlet, who's done admissions like everywhere. Did boarding school admissions at Lawrenceville. She was at Swarthmore. She was at Sarah Lawrence. Um, her last gig was Stanford. And she basically says what, what schools are looking for is authenticity, not the appearance of authenticity, not the presentation of authenticity, but authenticity. And then she says, if they can't trust what you say in any one part of your application, how can they trust the rest of it? Mm -hmm. And so that's just something to keep in mind. From a college admission standpoint, you want to be able to figure out who this kid is. And part of what you do to figure that out is look at where they spend their time. And that involves electives. It involves summers. And it involves choices you make, especially in things like electives, because a lot of times schools know, okay, everybody had to take this algebra class, and this geometry class, and this world history class. So I can't really learn necessarily by your course selection there. But when I look at your electives and your extracurriculars and your summers, that's a little bit of – that's supposed to be a window into what – who you are and help me to understand you. And so if you just throw the whole thing off because you don't do what you really enjoy, I can certainly tell you that's not what any admission officer wants to hear. Right, right. I think that's like really – um sort of one of the challenges that we deal with all of our lives is trying to figure out who we are and what we're good at. Cause you know, we're all good at different things and we can all contribute 
in really different ways. But it's so hard sometimes for people to figure out what that thing is and just to feel comfortable to say, you know, I'm not good at this, but I'm awesome at that. So that's what I'm going to do, you know, and to take a lot of pride in that. That's, I think, where your true productivity and happiness lies and like being who you are and doing the things that you're good at. Well, and another thing, I'm glad you brought that up because I'll tell you something else. It's really, really hard. I mean, I relegate against it, the whole idea of doing what you think somebody wants to do from a college standpoint, um, but I, and not doing, not doing you, but I totally understand it because you're looking at it from the standpoint of, wait a minute here, I have a goal and my goal is to get in. If my goal is to get in, why would I not want to figure out the things that I think help me get in and do those behaviors? So it's almost counterintuitive. For me to tell you, do you, don't focus on what you think they want, just do who you are, right. when my goal is to get admitted. Right. So I don't want to be insensitive to that because it's almost, you're kind of almost hardwired to think that way. Like, you know, if my goal is to get a promotion at work, then what does the boss want? What do, you know, like you start to try to figure that out. And so I get that mindset. My goal is to get the prize. What do, you know, what do I need to do to get the prize? But keep in mind, college admissions is not supposed to be a prize that is won, you know, but a match that is made. And that's one of my favorite all-time quotes. Right. College admissions is not a prize to be won, but a match to be made. And if you're looking at it from a match standpoint, you know, I'm going to have a fantastic interview coming up later with the uh, VP of enrollment at Bucknell, my other Lisa, Lisa Keegan. And in my pre-meeting with her, I'm like, Lisa, what do you want to talk about? What are your passions? She's like, Mark, I want to talk about fit. I want to talk about colleges picking, about students using how to pick a college based on fit and not external factors. And yeah. fit is really important and it applies here as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I think if you look at it, like, let's say you like a person and you then change who you are so that person will like you. But then when you're in a relationship with that person, they don't actually like you. Yes. And they like fake you and fake you. You don't probably don't like, don't like fake you. And so then it, the relationship's going to fail. And I think the same thing is true for colleges. If you pretend to be one way, mm -hmm. you know, it's not going to be a great fit for you. So it's better just to be who you are. I agree a hundred percent. Let's drop. That's a drop the mic comment, Lisa. We're ending it with that. <laughs> See you next week. All right. Thank you. And now this week's interview with a special guest. All right, friends. I am very, very, very excited about uh, a final part with Courtney Minden. This is all about Babson. This is replacing our college spotlight. And we do a 40 minute deep dive on Babson. Courtney starts out with her elevator pitch, who Babson is. She tells us what a deliberate dreamer is. She tells us about the Bow Consortium. She tells us about the Weissman Foundry. She talks to us about how Babson used, utilizes Boston in the education. She talks about what MCFE is. She talks about their entrepreneurship program and why it is consistently considered the number one or one of the number one entrepreneurship programs in the country. And then Courtney talks about how every student Ed Babson starts their own business. And Courtney shares why students pick Babson over other schools. Courtney shares what Babson needs to improve. And she shares who some of the famous alumni are that have attended the school. Um, so it's a really good interview. I think you're going to really enjoy it and listen and enjoy. All right, Courtney. So let's jump right in. Why don't you take three to five minutes and just give us an overview of Babson College? I mean, you alluded to it last week, but you know, the, the, the elevator speech, you say, That's right. you know, students are doing elevator speeches. What's your Babson elevator speech? My, yeah. So my rocket pitch is here. So Babson college is located about 10 miles outside of Boston in beautiful Wellesley, Massachusetts. And we are actually in going into our second century. We, we celebrated our centennial last year and are really, really excited about Babson as um, not only just a business school, as we're known, we're known for a school that offers a business degree for both undergrad and graduate, but we are a school that is really thinking about entrepreneurial leadership. And there's a big distinction between business, entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurial leadership. And in terms of entrepreneurial leadership, it's really teaching our students how to integrate in innovation, creativity, risk, maybe a, a small dose of failure and, and, and learning from failure 
into really being able to tackle the challenges and the opportunities of the future. You know, we always say throughout throughout the years, you know, when you're in college, you're training for the jobs and the experiences that actually haven't been fathomed of yet. You know, when That's I was so in, true. When I was in college, we had just gotten email, much less smartphones. The fact that I know somebody working at Google, I, if you, if I went back in a time machine, I would never know what, what, what's a Google. Yeah. Um, and so, so you're not necessarily at Babson training to start a business or to go into business. You're training to be able to go into any situation and be the revolutionary, be the visionary in order to make the world of business and beyond better. And, and we always say that um, Babson is a campus of what we're now calling deliberate dreamers. Mm, so like this, the people who, thank you, it's new. Um, the people who Was are, that a Courtney invention? Is that no, a Courtney? no, no. It's our new, mer- I'm, I'm trying some stuff out. It's our new branding. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> but no, so, it, so a Babson student as a deliberate dreamer is somebody who is always thinking ahead, always thinking of the next thing, always looking to see how something can be done better, more efficient, um, and and for the betterment of society. I always sort of joke that, you know, the Babson student in, say, a Cadoba, because they're the ones saying, oh, I think if you made the line, you know, horizontal versus vertical, you'd be able to serve more people and people would be in better moods. <laughs> you know, they're sort of they're outside the thinking, box thinking, outside the box thinking and um, thinking long term. And, you know, so so you see, so going getting back to the actual practicality of Babson, it's it's really going to school and and learning from a curriculum that is a combination of a business curriculum with liberal arts elements, and really look at, looking at business and entrepreneurial leadership in an interdisciplinary and experiential way. What I mean by that is, you know, if you want to go into real estate, you need to understand the business of real estate, but you also need to understand the science of sustainability. And so we are bringing those, all those experiences to you so that when you're weeding through the rules and regulations of a, of a development property, you, you have that, all that understanding. Or if you are working abroad, which by statistically most professionals will have an experience abroad, not only are you um, culturally aware, um, but you also have a foreign language under your belt. So it's it's so it's really is the yin and the yang of the quantitative curriculum versus the understanding of sort of the the human element. And I know like pretty much a hundred percent of people are majoring in business in some capacity, right? That's right. so that they're for business. And I've had students. In fact, it happened to me about two months ago. Somebody in the Philadelphia area, and I was telling them about Babson. I thought this Babson would be fantastic. And the mom, the mom was a big liberal arts person herself. And she thought, well, I don't know if something 100 percent business is going to give my child the liberal arts that I think they should have. But in reality, like half your classes are liberal arts. Can you talk a little bit about your bio consortium and and how students utilize that? Yeah, so students really do get a a depth and breadth of classes that go outside of business. Uh, You know, first of all, internally, you just mentioned 50 percent of the courses you're going to take our liberal arts classes. Uh, our students have joked in the past that when looking for a job, the um, the business curriculum is going to get you that job, but the liberal arts curriculum is going to get you the promotion because oh, like you're that. able to think across disciplines and be able to think a little differently than anyone else in the room and have the courage to be able to to express that. And and so you know when you hear conversations with 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 our faculty members, they they really aren't these linear thinkers around the bottom line and the quantitative um, linear journey. It, it really is taking um, you know, your, your business mindset, and but infusing it with the knowledge that you need in order to understand the humanities, the science, the, the arts. We have a really rich arts environment at Babson. Um, and we also have, as you mentioned, we have what we call the Bow Consortium, and that stands for Babson, Olin, and Wellesley. And so I mentioned before, we're about a mile away from Wellesley College, uh, which is an, an um, um, all women's college um, down in, in central, central Wellesley. And we also have the Olin School of Engineering that is literally next door to us. Um, we, they opened in 2001, 
um, on land that was previously owned by Babson. So we are we are we are um, next door neighbors, and they um, all the schools as part of the consortium open up their courses to any student from the other two schools. So if you want to learn about Russian literature, you can go down and take class at Wellesley College. Um, even gentlemen can go down to Wellesley College. And um, and then if you want to sort of take your business acumen and learn about the engineering aspect of your idea, you can be taking classes um, at, at the Olin School of Engineering. Uh, you see a lot of synergy between the three schools also through our foundry. So we have what's called the Weissman Foundry, which is essentially a maker and design and innovation space that is available to all three schools. So it's on our campus, but we actually have student workers, student workers we call captains, and they're from Wellesley, Olin, and Babson. So anytime you walk into the foundry, you're all actually going to be encountering students from all three schools who are leading any kind of initiative. And there's everything in there from a test kitchen to a um, um, to some 3D uh, printers. There are workbenches, and, and you can you can nurture any kind of idea, business plan. You know, one one night, um, some of our student workers were a little restless in the summer, and they went and they made pillows for one of our admission officers because they thought his office was a little bland. And um, but this is a great way for our all three students or all three schools to be together and um, and learn from each other. We cannot have a business education without the liberal arts. And it's just great that you have those other institutions as well to tap into all their curriculum. I have to tell you, I love Wellesley. I think it's gorgeous. I love the nature. I just I love the whole feel of the whole place. And and um, I do boarding school placement as well. I never told you this, Courtney, but I have two students that graduated from Dana Hall, which is obviously really close to you. Two seniors. Yeah, right there. And, and I also work with three students from Wellesley this year. But I just love um, love Wellesley. Just it's it's gorgeous and it's safe and and I think it's there's a high quality of life being in Wellesley as well. There is. And then there's also Boston. And it is very easy to get into Boston. You can, you know, we have public transportation through the subway, which we call the T, and um, a train station. We also have a deal with Uber. Um, Uber do, gives discounted rides for all of our Babson students. So to get into the city via Uber is not as expensive as you might think. And um, and, and also shuttles run um, throughout the, the weekend and um, shuttles also go into Wellesley and, and to Wellesley College. So from a transportation standpoint, you really aren't sort of landlocked into the Wellesley suburban experience all the time. And so um, I always like to say that, you know, you can judge a, a campus life and campus vibrant, vibrancy by the fact that if you were ever to airlift a, um, a campus and put it in the middle of nowhere, put it in the middle of the Mojave Desert, it is still an active, living, breathing, energetic ecosystem, even within their community. And we have that. But then as a bonus, you're right, you can go down into the center of Wellesley and, and um, meet up with other, other students at Wellesley or Olin or go into Boston. Yeah, and I'm sure you you utilize Boston for internships. I can't imagine you're not doing that. Can you talk about how you you tap in your students tap into to Boston as a place to test some of their ideas and apply their business concepts? Absolutely. Uh, Massachusetts I think has this great secret of being very much an epicenter of innovation. You think of New York and you think of Silicon Valley when you think of business, but we have not only do we have you know a, a, a bustling downtown, but we also have a, what we call the 128 corridor that has massive companies such as um, New Balance. We have Converse right downtown. So again, Seekers. We have we have a lot of of, of shoe manufacturing, but we you know um, Amazon is here and PwC, and so so we we have all of these companies who again and again just by reputation alone look to Babson students to do internships as well as projects for them. We have a, um, a program or class called McPhee, and it's a management consulting experiential class. And these companies that are, that are in greater Boston will hire Babson to send a group of students to look at something that they would like more research or investigation on. And they actually go into the company. They do a consulting uh, 
a project with them, and then they present to the company the changes that they that they recommend. And this wow. has been done. They did a, a project with um, the Red Sox. They, but then they also did one with a local juice bar who wanted to nice. sell up Puma. Again, I'm talking about sneakers. Puma <laughs> had, had a uh, taking me back to my high school. Puma. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I had. I actually was once interviewing one of our students. And he did a McPhee with a, um, a a company that has some defense contracts. And I said, oh, what was your project? And he looked and he said, I can't tell you. And I said, oh, okay. I, I said, oh, you can kind of, I think you can give me the gist of it. He goes, I can't tell you. Okay. <laughs> okay. So our, so our students have ethics when they sign up in New York. Wow. But not Good even telling an interview, even if it meant not getting the job. But it is, it's a, it's a legitimate way for these students, for students to go in and do a, a, a living uh, consulting experience. Awesome. So we, we can't talk about Babson without talking about entrepreneurship. Um, you know, several uh, several news organizations have ranked you as the number one entrepreneurship program in, in the country. And in some cases, you've been ranked that way for more than 20, 25 years consecutively, year after year after year. So, and I think that applies to both what you do in the undergrad level as well as what you do with your MBA. So my, my question is, what is it that you feel you're doing that's differentiating you from your overlap schools when it comes to entrepreneurship? I mean, you don't get you know, ranked number one, 25 straight years without doing something. I'm very critical of rankings because they're so subjective. But what I will say is when a school's ranked really high, it's very good. It doesn't mean it's good for you, but it's very good. So you're clearly doing something right. What do you feel it is? Yeah. Well, first of all, do you know how much pressure that is? <laughs> yeah. You don't want to drop to number two on your, on Courtney's watch. Yeah, You don't want to be that person. And so every <laughs> September we hold our breath. <laughs> like, oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah, thank God you're number one again. <laughs> you know, I have to tell you a, a, a quick story. I was visiting Sidwell Sidwell Friends, um, and you know they've had so many of the president's kids over the years. Mm -hmm. And I was visiting a, a friend of mine as director of admission there at the time, and we we're having lunch, and it was at the time the Obamas were coming through. And they were down to two schools, Georgetown Day and Sidwell Friends. And, and of course, the Clintons had gone there. Nixon, so many presidents had picked Sidwell. And so and so the director of admission, you know, he said to me, do you know how much pressure this is? So when you told me it's so much pressure to stay number one, I had that flashback. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, you don't want to be you don't want to be that guy who yeah. loses it. Yeah. So so but to answer your question of, of what, what do we do, we do differently? I, I think yeah, entrepreneurship is a very popular word these days. And it's you know, it is something that I mean, I'm seeing pop up in um, liberal arts schools as you know you're even seeing it in you know the medical community and and it, I do think you, your mind when you say entrepreneur you go into how do you monetize what you want to do i.e how do you start a business uh -huh. and you know I'd be a hypocrite if I said oh we're not about that I mean right. I, I didn't tell you is that our first year every student starts a business as part right. of the foundations of management entrepreneur program where the students will you know pitch They'll get they'll get funding for our business. They will, um, you know, they'll run the business and then they'll dissolve the business at the end of the year because most businesses fail and you have to also learn how to uh, dissolve a business. So so we do teach about on, to be, how to be an entrepreneur so that you can start your own pursuit. But we also teach finance. But we also teach marketing. We all, that's a category into unto itself. Where Babson is different is that beyond saying we're a school that, you know, is, is one of the top schools in entrepreneurship, it's because whether we're teaching finance or supply chain or accounting or diversity, we're doing it from that entrepreneurial leadership mindset. So you can go into finance or you can go into government or you can go into teaching or you can go into admission. And how are you going to be the entrepreneurial leader who has the qualities to be able to see through uncertainty and to be able to um, say, all right, in a room full of people, this is the dramatic turn I think we need to do, and this is why. This is how I'm going to be culturally literate in being able to express my plan to a, a global audience without without offending anybody or, or without well, while still being persuasive. So do you think that's what all these publications that consistently have you at the top, do you think that's what they're recognizing, that you do that just better than others? I think so. I think, and I also think the fact that 
we are, um, we double down on it. You know, it's not something that we're offering this year and then next year something else will come up and we'll, and a donor will give to, you know, um, forensic accounting and we'll be a, a school known for forensic accounting. Um, I do think learning trends come and go. And, but we've been able to, you know, we were founded as a school for entrepreneurial leadership um, in 1919 you know, by the guy who predicted the stock market crash. Wow. And so, <laughs> Some <laughs> so good roots. <laughs> about unpopular beliefs. <laughs> you know, he, you know, he, he's actually, so some fun Babson and trivia, Roger Babson was quite a character and he, um, his sort of the symbol that he um, clung to or uh, uh, for his success was the Newton theories of relativity. And so we actually have Newton apple trees on our campus um, at, where we, um, you know, sort of what comes up must go down, i.e. the stock market. Um, but we have the trees that actually came from the original Newton tree. Because wow. He was so obsessed with it. He invested in Newton trees. So that's how we started. And so it's in your DNA, basically. It's in our DNA. And 200 years from now, we're going to be teaching entrepreneurial leadership and it's not going to be recognizable to how it is today. We have the longevity and, and, the, and the outcomes in order to be able to, um, to walk the walk. And and I know you overlap with, you know, some really large business schools with big names like Dyson at Cornell and Ross at Michigan and many, many others. When students pick Babson over those schools, I know you, you're, you're a numbers person, you're a researcher. I'm sure you have some type of institutional research somewhere to indicate why they pick you. Uh, what would be the reasons why they pick you? And what would also be the reasons why you, you lose out to some of those schools sometimes? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think one thing that's really important to understand is there is no other school that looks like Babson. It, and it's a, it's a very strange phenomenon where there are so many different colleges out there, which is a good thing. But when I, when you asked me who I overlaps, who you just mentioned, they're all universities that have, that have a business college inside of them. Right. And so from a curricular standpoint, we look like a por portion of a large university mm -hmm. from a campus standpoint. We look like a school, uh, like a New England residential school where faculty are here to teach and that the, the you know, the, the notion of the lecture hall, we have like one lecture hall on campus because we don't need, them. we need, you know, we need modular furniture so that we can be writing and, and, and um, working in teams. And so, so that's actually, that's a, that's a, a really distinctive combination that you're going and learning world-class business theory. But when you come out of your dorm room in the morning, you're going to a class learning that business theory from a faculty member who is going to meet you for coffee after, who's also going to open up their, you know, I'm trying to think of what the 2021 version of a Rolodex is, but going to open you up to, the, to their network and their reputation. Many of our faculty, actually, they've been in business before they were actually even teachers. So that, that just opens up a whole new level of, of networking. Um, you're able to have what our former president used to call accidental collisions, where you're, you kind of start talking to a classmate about an idea you might have, and lo and behold, you've started a business together. And you might not have ever really hung out before, um, but you ha we have a campus where you can be in the commons and just start having a really cool 2 a.m. conversation, and, and lo and behold, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking about Shark Tank. And so it's that it's that residential feel that really generates that that kind of energy around um, being being better by using sort of the human capital on your on your campus, which I don't necessarily know that you get as naturally at a larger school. Now, that said, you do you're, you kind of hit the nail on the head when we lose students. It, it, it's largely because of the allure of the possibilities within the, um, the larger school. And I'm not saying Babson has a dearth of possibilities. There's thousands of things you can do with mm -hmm, a Babson degree. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sitting here talking to you from South Boston. Um, my state rep is a Babson grad. Nice. And so he's, in, he's using entrepreneurship and government. In com at commencement, we were closed out by Jamie Kent, who's a Billboard Top 20 singer. Um, he's always been, he's always loved music. He's always been a musician. He went to Babson and now he doesn't need a manager because he can make his own deals. And, um, so we have the possibilities, but then, you know, when you're 17 and thinking, Ooh, business for the rest of my life, I mean, this is a big decision. Or I could go to NYU and try out business and then go into Tisch 
although I know mm-hmm. it's not as easy as mm-hmm. that. I'm, I'm using, I'm probably right. too specific, but go to a, a larger university and try out anything from business to psychology and then be pre-med and then go into dance. You can't do that fast. And you do have to be more focused. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, and we're, we're never going to be able to offer that kind of experience. What we can offer you is the ability to have a journey where you try different things, just not as divergent as going from med to dance. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. The recommended resource for episode 179 is the Facebook group Grown and Flown. Now, friends, if you think last week's group, Paying for College 101, was big with its 105,000 members, Grown and Flown has a whopping 193,000 members. And by the time you hear this, who knows? It might even be 194. It is a parents' group to talk about all things college. I'd like to thank our listeners, actually, who have mentioned our podcast in either Pay for College 101 or Grown and Flown, because quite a few of you have said you found us. Um, in these Facebook forms, when another one of our listeners recommended our podcast. So thank you for that. I was talking to Eric Furter recently. For those of you who don't know, Eric worked for gee, over a decade um, at Columbia and then over a decade at UPenn, serving as dean and director. He also worked for some time at the Common App. And he'll be on our podcast and I haven't decided yet if it'll be late 2021 or early 2022, but we'll record it late this summer. But when talking to Eric, he mentioned to me that he's really enjoyed doing presentations for Grown and Flown. And I, I mentioned this to you because you may think, well, it's a parent chat group. But they do have webinars, and they do attract the caliber of guests that we have on this podcast. They're a private group, but it's quite honestly not really hard to get approved for admission. We will now return to the final segment with Courtney Minden as she's doing deep dive for us on Babson College. So what do you feel Babson needs to work on to, to go to even the next level? I, I think a lot of it is what we've been talking about is, is how do you define entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial leadership? And I think sometimes there's, there's like this Goldilocks curse that we have is like, how do we, how do we describe the narrative of Babson in a just right mentality? Because sometimes we'll go and, and you know, we'll talk about all, you know, one week on our website, it'll be about all of these great entrepreneurs. So Jamie Siminoff is front and center. And then we talk about the Institute for Family Business and, you know, talk about, you know, another small business owner and somebody's, somebody's like, I don't want to be that person. I want to, I, I want to go to Wall Street. And so we've lost the finance person. We're so strong in finance. We have, we have a trading room floor. We have Bloomberg terminals. If you walk into the commons, you're going to see the crawl. We have a Babson investment group. Um, but then sometimes we start talking about all that and we double down on finance. And then all of a sudden there's, well, I thought you were entrepreneurs. I want to start my own business. So it's really <laughs> being able to sort of balance out the, 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 the depth of possibilities at a school that where, where we grant one degree. And I'm sure one of the challenges, you're, you're, you're not on ESPN. So, you no. know, Michigan, Ross and Indiana, Kelly, like they can all be on ESPN and get their name out there. And I, I mentioned that only because uh, I'm thinking of a conversation I had with another Midwest family earlier this year. And I said, you know what? I think Babson's a perfect school for you. They said, what's Babson? I've never heard of it. <laughs> so I said, so then I explained, you know, who you were. And they started looking into you and they started loving you. And um, all the way to the point where right now you're like the number one school for the sun. Uh, but then <clears throat> the parents started saying, but I don't know if anybody's heard of Babson in the Midwest. Is that going to hurt me? What would what would you say to that family? <laughs> we have a joke that um, every once in a while, if, if we do go kind of outside of our reputational um, wheelhouse, people will look at us and say, what's a Babson? <laughs> 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 well, we have to do what a Babson is. No, it, you're right. But, but the thing is, we might not necessarily have the Midwest reputation yet, right. but we have a global reputation and everything is global right now. And so while you know, you might, your dream might be to go to Procter and Gamble and you're thinking I'm from Cincinnati and nobody at Procter and Gamble has ever heard of Babson. Well, I can guarantee you they've heard of Babson at Procter and Gamble, Latin America. Uh, in some ways, the irony is in some ways we are stronger in terms of brand name abroad than we are in, in some domestic areas. 
in, in Latin, in, in um, places like Brazil, Colombia, Central and South America, Babson's a household name. And, my, and then that goes up into Miami. But then, <laughs> yeah, you go into the Midwest. But, but really, um, I think even if you've never, if you don't know what a Babson is, once you see it, you can never unsee it. And it's, it's one of those, we, we hear from employers all the time that say, uh, my entire career, I have welcomed internship cohorts from Wharton, Harvard, Ross, Kelly only. And then I got one Babson student and I will never, ever, ever have a cohort without at least four Babson students. They are, they take initiative. They think out, I don't have to inst- micromanage and instruct them to death. They look at a spreadsheet and say, oh, I saw this, I saw this. I learned this three years ago in QTM. They respectfully um, try to you know, nurture change, and they're you know they become a, a, they become the living embodiment of Babson and more off to the races. Um, so it is. Or, and also, I would say to parents, just watch, just take a few minutes and watch. I, Babson's on a massive upward trajectory, and I think you know at, at commencement, our, our board chair. Um, incorporated into her speech that when COVID started, a faculty member said, this is Babson's spring training. We we prepare. Not that we were excited about it. We were not, as I talked to you from my kitchen. <laughs> but this kind of social just revolution and, and, and disruption is what we're preparing for. We're preparing for a world that is not recognizable from the world in 1984 or 1884. And so, and so, the Babson people who have sampled from the Babson ecosystem are prepared for that kind of change. And I think that is, that's all the reputation that we're ever going to need. Well, I told the family, I said, I said, set up a meeting with the career center and I guarantee they will have uh, students. They can tell you about that have been Babson grads that have gone on to do big things in the Midwest. And so yes. that was my answer. We also have, and I don't have the number on me, but we also have, at least four sports team owners. So we're not on ESPN for players. Yeah, you really are. It was maybe, I don't know, less than a year ago, it feels like to me, six months. I don't know. I'm in a time warp, but I'm looking at the news and Atlanta's own Arthur Blank, who's a co-founder of Home Depot and owner of the Atlanta Falcons, announced he was given $50 million to his alma mater, bought Babson College. Yes, that was a good day. No, you guys were happy, but that was a good day, wasn't it? <laughs> it was a good day. Yeah, so so Arthur Blank is an alum, and um, yeah, known for both Home Depot and the Falcons, and he's also known for his just superior understanding and celebration of good customer service, mm-hmm. superior customer service and marketing, and and so he's got the the he wrote a whole book on the pr- principles of successful entrepreneurship and and um, the secret to his success, and you know he uses as an example when you go to Home Depot. You can return anything. And and a few years ago, many years ago, there was a woman who came very angry and said, "I bought these tires here at Home Depot, and um, I they don't they they don't work. They're not. I'm not satisfied. Give me my money back." And our, and Arthur Blank said, and we said, "Do you have the Do you have the receipts?" Yes. And said to and the, the the manager took him her over to the cash register and gave her the cash back and everything like that. And the punchline of that is um, Home Depot has never sold tires ever. So it's, it's the customer is always right. And we actually go through something called homecoming training um, so that we can learn about how he, how the, the uh, Falcons um, actually, you know, how they've been successful. So, so that's my long way of my, my saying, but it's really cool to have this gift that is dedicated to, you know, sort of promoting entrepreneur and celebrating entrepreneurial leadership through things like scholarships. We have we have a lot of that money is going towards need based scholarships. Um, it's going towards understanding entrepreneurial leadership ecosystem. And so, how can we create entrepreneurial? See, even deans of admission at entrepreneur schools. <laughs> that's a tr- that's a tricky one. Entrepreneurial leadership, um, the entrepreneurial leadership village that we're still trying to to um, envision both virtually and physically as a sort of a beehive of entrepreneurial ideas 
and that's being that's that's going to be coming out of the Arthur M. Blank School for Entrepreneurial Leadership, and um, and and we're going to have cases available. Students are going to be able to write cases based on um, superior. Um, principles of business. And so it's so again, it's it's kind of given us this this injection of excitement over the future of entrepreneurial leadership. And so I'll go back to your your former question of, you know, how do we do things differently? I think I think that 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 grant is a perfect example of it because any <laughs> any um home, you know, home improvement slash football magnet can give money and we could we can create a, you know, the blank dorms or the blank school of, of, uh, or the, uh, the blank admission office, but he's really created a way for us to reimagine entrepreneurial leadership. So we're so excited. I'd be excited too to get 50 million. I am too. Yeah. <laughs> so who, who are your other owners? You have four owners. That's incredible for, for a school yes. of your size. And, and, you know, we never mentioned, why don't you mention how many students are at Babson for our listeners? So we have so so we have about um, from from an undergraduate perspective we have about twenty eight hundred students so we are considered a small to medium um, school probably another three thousand or so graduate students for the MBA yeah but who what, who what other owners do you have I mean I think having one is impressive oh you no no I well? shouldn't even have said that because now I now, now, now I put you on the spot <laughs> <laughs> the Molson family so we have Blank who's both Atlanta Falcons and Atlanta FC the soccer team cincinnati reds president and chief operating officer wow and the montreal canadians jeff molson so okay sorry three but four sports teams no it's not that day that counts we'll count the teams (laughs) and three is impressive so that's great that's awesome that's right that's right so courtney talk a little bit about the admission process so uh, a couple questions i've heard you speak before and i know that like a lot of business schools you're definitely looking at math ability and you're studying that success track record in math. I know that's one thing I've heard you speak about before. How much of a track record does someone need to demonstrate in business before they come in? How important is that? And what? Are, and just in general, why don't you talk about some factors that you look for in the admission process that may be a little different other than just like high grades, you know? You know, the thing is, you don't really have to have that business track record. Mm-hmm. You are 17 years old. You're just starting. Mm-hmm. We do look for involvement, um, but the reason that we're looking at involvement is not to sort of pinpoint what specifically you're involved in, whether it be um, student government president or captain of a sports team or employee of the month. Those are all great, but I'm not I'm not looking, and I think this is sort of an urban legend. I'm not saying, oh, we need more politics at Babson, so I, I got to get more class presidents or the, the whole urban legend of when, you know, when the oboe player graduates, we look for another one. I'm not <laughs> looking for you know, America's next entrepreneur, we see it, we, we, we see it, we definitely see it. But, but what I'm looking for is that, that instinct and that need to really stretch your mind co-curricularly. So, so the fact that you want to be involved in something, the fact that, you know, if I see you in the hall before your interview and you can, in an animated fashion, tell me about one or two things that you love to do, you might not ever do those things again. You might never be the newspaper editor again, but you're going to have that fire in the belly to do something. And, you know, I, I, I did explain before that we're a very residential school. The energy and the um, sort of the vibe of the school comes from student engagement and that the students who are, are, are doing more than going to class. They are they're 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 the backbone of our of our school. They're student government. They're in the arts. They're in in residential um, life. And so. We want the students who are going to want to maybe even try something new or, you know, think about, I never thought I would do a rocket pitch. And now here I am, the, the president of the Boston, the Babson Investment Group. So what we're looking for is that you you know why you're applying to Babson. You might not have a five-year plan, but you can articulate the elements of what the Babson education can get you. And, and, and that's, I mean, that, that's a huge curve. There are some students who, who know exactly what they want. Maybe their parents were in business. They were, you know, they were, they started their school's entrepreneur club. They, believe it or not, we have students who are, have been on Shark Tank and are on Shark Tank. I'm sure, I'm sure you do. I could so see Babson student on on Shark Tank. Hey, I could recommend some products for you. (laughs) <laughs> um, that we have. Uh, may I interest you in a chemical that you put on your shoes called Detrafel, where you can <laughs> get rained on without, <laughs> without soggy <laughs> shoes, or again, socks that are, you know, that uh, 
um, are super comfortable and um, the company don't donate them to homeless. That's Bombas socks. So um, no, no, we definitely have that. That those, I love Bombas. Is Bombas affiliated with with uh, Babson? Yeah, undergrad undergrad alums. They oh, are wow. my absolute favorite socks. They're my mother's. I just had to give. They them are to amazing. Birthday. Mm-hmm. I've been big on, ba- on on Bomba Socks. Well, before they started, like they went on Shark Tank and hit it big and they're on TV. Uh, maybe four years ago, I bought everybody these Bomba Socks for Christmas because they're like the most comfortable thing I'd ever ever had on before. Oh, they're the best. Yeah. And I still, one of my nieces in, in Denver still talks about those Bomba Socks. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that was a, a Babson alum. Good stuff. Yeah, and they donate they donate a pair to the homeless every time I know. they make a sale. So, so there's that social entrepreneurship. Um, you know, Jamie Siminoff is the, is the person most famous to not make a Shark Tank deal. He walked away uh, when Richard Branson was, was um, part one of the Sharks and um, went out on his own and then uh, Branson invested in him on his own. And, um, and so he, in ring is the, was the second biggest acquisition by Amazon second only to whole foods. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, I hope these, hope these alums get, give back. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> R- Jamie, Jamie Siminoff is, is our president's former student. I think there you uh, go. <laughs> I think we'll, we'll be hearing a lot. He was actually our commencement speaker this year. So good stuff, but that's, you know, that could be a part of the application, but you know, I just read I just read an application this this winter where a student is so interested in fashion and wants to learn how to monetize fashion, and um, or there are some students that just love history, but they they also know that they want to they they they're curious about the of, of the about business, and you know from a from a practical perspective, ninety nine percent of our students are employed after graduation and but within six within i think six months of graduation and this average start is starting salary is sixty two thousand. yeah and imagine good. having that kind of outcome but being able to do what you love and so that you know that again that's what we're looking for from the you know four years prior is to look to see you know are you going to have that kind of instinct that fire in the belly that bit that that self-advocacy in order to to grab that at that outcome so I'm hearing, pa- you know, some kind of passion for something. Yep. Um, I'm hearing um, an understanding of who Babson is and sort of what Babson can sort of do for you. And just a, an understanding of the institution. As I said, I've heard you before say you tend to look at quantitative skills mm-hmm. as, you know, as, as part of your evaluation. You're looking for some proficiency in math. You find that just correlates well with success in your program? It does. In terms of setting up our students for success, it, the quantitative curriculum is not easy at any school. Mm-hmm. And so we do want to make sure that the classes that you've taken, um, particularly pre-calculus, give you the foundation to succeed when you get there. Because it does us no good if we admit you and you just uh, you know, can't handle the work from the get-go. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had to sort of break, break my heart and say, I know you're entrepreneurial and I know you're great. You're going to do great things. and You're going to get in somewhere wonderful, but you don't have the math and you're going to be miserable here. So, you know, that's, if there's any advice I could give to, you know, even like a ninth and 10th grader is really start to think if you want a business school or an engineering school or any kind of very quantitative degree, you do need to start planning ahead to say, how am I going to get through high school with a great foundation for that con- that type of learning. Thank you, Courtney. Now, before you go, we put all our, our, our guests on the hot seat. So this is the short, quick lightning round. Absolutely. Favorite sport to play or watch? Oh, um, I mean, I'm in Boston. It has to be, it has to be watching the Red Sox, but it depends on the year. <laughs> that makes sense if they're doing well. <laughs> if someone visit Wellesley, what restaurant should they go to? Um, right now they should go to the cottage because down, downtown Wellesley, because they've got really good outdoor seating. Nice. Hardest question a student's ever asked you? Uh, hardest question a student's ever asked me. I think this is the hardest question. <laughs> <laughs> On the podcast. I'll leave that out. I'll say it's Mark. Okay. We'll let you pass on that one if you're drawing a blank. Yeah. If, if money was no issue, what car would you drive? I just got a new car. And so... It, uh, but I'll upgrade myself. I would drive because it's so inefficient, but so great. I would drive a Range Rover. There you go. I'm going to do another one of these. Money's no issue. Where would you go on vacation? I I really want to go to Fiji. 
There you go. Awesome. Awesome. And book you've read that's impacted you the most in the last three years? Hmm. Impacted me the most in the last three years. I used to say ever, but, you know, nobody could answer that question. It was like, that's so hard. Yeah. Um, actually, I, I'm going to go past three years. There you go. That's fine. Yeah. Um, I Because I read this a few years, uh, almost 20 years ago. Jeez. Um, Hope in the Unseen about a student um, from uh, the from DC who really, really, his dream was to go to MIT. And it was a, it was a, it was an expansion on a, a, a news article in the Wall Street Journal. Cool. And the last one, your best advice for parents and students. <sighs> Have fun with this. This is, this is, uh, this is the sort of the golden time of your life where you really are taking a step towards your future. It's the first independent students. It's the first independent um, decision you've ever made drown out the white noise around you about what you should do or shouldn't do it go with your gut and and when you go with your gut that's when things get fun courtney this has been really a, my pleasure and a treat i've enjoyed it tremendously i know our listeners will as well just share the babson website and anywhere else you recommend that an interested student goes on your on your website if there's any particular social media or direct interested people where they should go www.babson.edu and Go to the go. It's it. The gold is in the front page, the cover page. It's where you can get Babs and Thought in Action and all of our articles. And I think the best websites are the ones where you you hit, you click once, and then all of a sudden you're down a rabbit hole and you emerge three hours later wondering what just happened. And that's what you will do when you go to the first page of the Babson. Fantastic. And are you on Twitter? Should we throw that out there? You a Twitter person? I'm not a Twitter person. No problem. We'll we'll stick with the Babson website. Thank you so 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 much, and I'll be in touch. All right. Thanks, Mark. This is fun. Awesome. Okay. Bye. Bye. Next week in the news, Legacy Admissions Banned in Colorado, an article by Scott Jacek of Inside Higher Ed. Our question next week is bonus content, and it's part two of three, where Mark and Lisa discuss what parents should be doing for their children in ninth and tenth grade to prepare them for college. Our interview is going to be with Christina Lopez, the Dean of Enrollment for Barnard College. It's part one of three on should you discuss your mental health challenges in your admission application. And our college spotlight comes to you from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and it is Lehigh University. See you next week, everybody. See you next week. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please subscribe so you get every episode as soon as it is released. If you are interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on your favorite podcast listing app. I am the producer of the Your College Bound Kid podcast, where we have a fantastic team of nine people. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. David Williams and Dr. Lisa Ruff. Our sound engineer who fixes all of our many errors is Nemanja Modfic. The amazing music you hear is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joy Stucker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Dalianas Dimitri. If you want to have a college coaching session with me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want to ask or a college you want Lisa or me to do a spotlight on, or if you have a recommended resource or an article you think we should share, just send it to questions at yourcollegebondkid.com. By the way, check out our website, where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is yourcollegeboundkid.com. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you, our family, next week.